Amen. My name is George Garza. I want to welcome everybody from the social media and the live. And I want to welcome the Coachella Valley, Wasco, Delano. We want to welcome everybody that's watching Lifehouse this morning. I'm one of the pastors at Lifehouse. We pastor Lifehouse in Coachella Valley, and we are so happy to be here. Uh, we are filling in for Pastor uh, Saul. I don't know where he's at. He's probably in New York, maybe eating a hot dog right there. If you're watching, Pastor, we miss you. Bring us a hot dog. We love you. <laughs> We're in a series called Dare to Connect. The, the message this morning is called Family Connection. I, it's a, it, 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 it has been an incredible series, and we're talking about family connection this morning. And just, just a show of hands, raise your hands if you're the oldest of your family. Raise your hands. Well, there's a lot of old. Okay, I, I, I have a word for you. You're not the boss of me. You can't control me. God didn't, mom and dad didn't put you in charge of the whole world. Raise your hands if you're the youngest of your family. I'm the youngest, I'm the youngest of my family. I got a word for you guys. You guys got away with murder. <laughs> mom and dad got tired of disciplining you with the last one. So they didn't discipline you. They left you alone so you grew up a brat. Spoiled. Yes, that's me. Oh, all the middle child, all the middle. If you're a middle child, raise your hand, raise your hand. I have a word for you. God knows your name, because <laughs> nobody else does. Your mom says, hey, Junior, uh, 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 Ethel, uh, cup. they forgot your name. They forgot your name. They forgot your name. Let me tell you something this morning. Uh, this, there is no perfect family. You can be a Christian under a roof, and not have a Christian home. J James Clear says it this way. He says, you, you don't rise to the level of your goals. He says, you fall to the level of your culture. A lot of us have fallen. Our families have fallen to the level of our culture. And it's destroying our homes. It's destroying us. In, in other words, you, you can have all the goals that your family is going to be loving, accepting, forgiving. It's going to be a united family. And, 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 and let me tell you, if, if you don't put the culture in place, it's going, it's going to eat up your house. It's going to eat you up. We, we weren't the only ones dysfunctional, though. The, the first family, Adam and Eve, uh, God made Adam first. Then he went to Tony Roma's and he took a rib from Tony, <laughs> threw some barbecue on it and made a woman. He had Eve and he, and he placed them in the garden. He says, I'm going to place you in the garden. You guys, need to, you, you guys need to care for the garden. And as they were caring for the garden, they pro, he said, all you have to do is don't touch that tree and, and multiply. So uh, that's crazy. Don't touch a tree and have sex all day. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Anyway, they, they made two, two boys, Cain and Abel. And then enters a dysfunction where Cain killed Abel. The, this first dysfunctional family was Adam and Eve. That was the first dysfunctional family and when, their son, when their son Cain killed Abel. And the culture that God put in place, it works. But because of sin, came into our homes through Adam and Eve. We're dysfunctional, and we need to admit it. We cannot, if, if a pastor always preaches the good side and tells you the good side of his family, of his kids, then he re really ain't telling you the whole story. My kids are one taco short of a combo, all of them. We're a dysfunctional family, and I'm a pastor. And I'm, I'm not proud of that, but that's just life. Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6, 6 through 9 writes this, and, and, and it's incredible because God starts putting order in our family right away since Deuteronomy. He says, write these commandments that I've given you today in your hearts. He says, write it in your hearts. Instead of it being a rule, or, or a guide, write it in your hearts. Get them inside of you and get them inside of your children. He says, talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the streets. Talk about them from the time that you get up to the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them to your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them in the doorpost of your homes and in your city. This is the order that God has placed for us to raise our family and to have a healthy family. This is creating a culture of one word that all of us hate. This is creating a culture of rules. Because if we don't have a culture of rules, 
in, in our home, rules and, 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 and boundaries, we're, we're going to be dysfunctional more. As it is, we're dysfunctional. But God gave us this to, to, to put rules and limits. And this is not about a power trip. It's, it's about protection and boundaries in our families. So boundaries is, is, is space and freedom to stop any form of abuse in the home. That's what those boundaries are for. If Junior is, is abusive, we need to shut him down right away. We ain't going to put up with that in our home. We're going to shut you down. We're going to pray for you. We're going to love on you. So this is the boundaries and the, and, and the protection that God has put in our homes. It's the parent's job to teach your children to follow rules and set boundaries. Boundaries is about physical. It's about the emotional. It's about the spiritual space. It, it's the stuff that parents teach their children to stop any form of abuse once they become adults. So, so there, is, there are many factors in, 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 in our disconnection as a family. I, I want to talk about a couple of them, a few of them t- this morning. They're in your notes. If you have notes, uh, if you don't have notes, raise your hands and the, and the ushers will bring you a note and a pen. You can write it down. I'm about notes. I'm about one-liners. So you, you might want to write something down here. The first one is, is infidelity. The first one is infidelity. It, it, it's, it's breaking the mirror. Infidelity is breaking the mirror and trying to get glue and put it together. It ain't going to work. Infidelity can be husband or wife. It could be a, it's an act of betrayal of a person that you trust. It could be a sexual, uh, it could be infidelity. This breaks the truth at the home, the trust in the home. And, and family member could be unfaithful. It's, it's harmful. It starts a chain, a chain in the family. I've had cousins that that their grand, great-grandfather had, he was unfaithful to grandma, and, and, and the son was unfaithful, and the son of the son was unfaithful, and the son of junior, all of them were unfaithful. It's a chain that's following you, and you don't even know it. And you think it's normal when it's really not normal. The only way to break the, 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 the chain of sin in your family is through obedience to the word of God. That's the only way. Will God break the chain? Yes, he will. But you've got to do your job. You still have to do your job. You've got to do your job. The next word is aggression. Any, any physical, spiritual, emotional, verbal abuse or sexual aggression, this, can, this disconnects the flow of family health. Physical abuse hurts. It disconnects, especially for all my machistas. I, don't, I, won't, I won't have you raise your hands because I know you're sitting here. All the macho camachos. All the guys that love to yell in their home. Man, let me tell you something. In the word of God, Jesus is depicted as the lamb. He's also depicted as the lion. Our problem is, man, is that sometimes we want to be the lion at home when your kids need the lamb. You need to be a lion at work and a lamb at home with your kids. They don't need a lion. They need a lamb that's humble. They need a lamb that understands them. They need a lamb that says, but what's happening? (laughs) They need a lamb, a mentality of a lamb of Jesus' heart towards your family. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, Aggression causes hatred. It causes yelling, anger, cussing. It destroys your emotions. It's impossible to erase them. It affects the mental health of any human. Aggression does that. Guess what parents and, and kids are watching? They're watching each other have aggression. Whatever they see, they do. My son is a reflection of me. My daughter's a reflection of me. Everything that you have presence in your life growing up, everything you heard, everything you've seen, you do as an adult. I know some of us in here really, we, we don't like our fathers because they left early. But everything that they did, they did enough damage for you to pick it up and bring it to the next generation with your family. And your kids are being raised the same way. And I know you hate that about yourself. Because I lived it. And we don't want that. We, don't, we want the best for our kids. But sometimes we're giving them every day the worst of us. Every day we give them the worst of us. Because you're one person in church and another person at home. And sometimes we become nacho libre. Can you take off your mask this morning and be real? Can you just take it off for once? And let God, God does not demand perfection. But he demands honesty. Can you be honest with God this morning? Can you be honest with him and let him in and say, I have aggression. I'm struggling. Aggression produces trauma in our kids. Last night after I preached this message, 
A little nine-year-old came to his mother right in front of me. She says, Pastor, can you pray for me? And he goes off on her. He just yells at her. And I, don't, I, don't, I didn't even ask the question, where does he get all that? Because daddy doesn't serve God. And daddy has an anger problem. So the little Pepito at nine years old is, is watching everything. And you go to work and you think about, I'm a bad example to my son. You're rubbing off on him. All the trauma is, is going down to another generation. It, it stops the normal development of a person. This breaks a person's boundaries. It causes fear of life. Kids, our kids are, are fearful. It, it, it makes you vulnerable in life. And it, it, it could also be spiritual abuse where you're literally Bible beating your son and your daughter to come to church. And you manipulate them. I don't want to go to church. Mom. I don't want to go to church. I'm here because you made me come, but I don't want. You can manipulate your kids to come to church. They gotta, at one point, they got to make their own decision. You can't force nobody to do nothing. It needs to happen from the heart. Are you listening to me? Another, another word is abandonment. This is the point where, 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 where mom and dad get divorced, and, and dad got divorced from mom way before he left her. It's abandonment. It's, 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 it's not only physical, it's, it's emotional. It's generational abandonment. It's also substituting parents, parents' presence for money. Some, some parents are, are so poor that the only thing they have to give their kids is money. He wants your time. He wants your posture. He wants your presence there. He wants your mind when he talks to you. Okay, have you gone to his baseball game, his soccer game? Have you been there for him? You abandon your kids a long time ago. So what do you do when you abandon your kids? You give them cell phones. You give them money. You have all these things that, that man, my, those, all those things shouldn't be given to a, a son or a daughter till they're 15, but you, you're giving it to them at nine. Why? Because you feel conviction, because you've abandoned your family. There's some of you sitting here that you've abandoned your family. You're so busy working and earning money, and you think, hey, I put a roof over your head. Let me tell you something. There are things that money can't buy. They want a father. They want somebody that's going to that's gonna raise them with love and understanding. Let me tell you something. Aband abandonment is bad. The next word is addictions. In the past, it was easy to identify addictions. It was illegal drugs, abuse, and al alcohol. Now, now a person can be addicted to work, to medications, to sex. A person can be addicted to food, to pornography, social media, sports, television. Anything that consumes you in, the, in the, is an unhealthy way. It produces stress, exhaustion, and pleasure. It represents turning all your priorities in life upside down. To concentrate on addictions, what, what happens when family is disconnected? Let me tell you a couple of the symptoms. What, what are the symptoms? Communication breaks down. When a family is disconnected, communication breaks down. Maybe that's happening in your home right now. When communication breaks down in your home with your wife and your kids, uh, listen to me, fathers. That home is crying out for a spiritual leader. Your wife is tired. She's been carrying you, whatever. She's been carrying you for a long time. So now she says, hey, take the batuta, take this rain. I don't want to be spiritual leader of my home anymore. God put you in charge. Will you rise up this morning and be the spiritual leader that your family needs? God is asking you this morning. He's asking you, can you be the spiritual leader of my home? Because there's so much dysfunction and help me fight the dysfunction in my home. When a woman fights the dysfunction by herself, she gets frustrated and she cries out. That's why your kids rather, rather be with their uncle or their grandfather because you're not the spiritual leader. And you get mad when your kids mention another, another father's name because you haven't been the father that you needed to be. I'm not trying to insult you this morning. I'm trying to fire you up. I'm trying to motivate you and inspire you to rise up and be the spiritual leader that your home needs. God is calling you this morning, men, to be the spiritual leader of your home. When there's, when, 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 when there's so much dysfunction, the symptoms of lack of communication, hatred, bitterness, conflict, everyone thinks they know what's going on, but they don't. They're assuming it's a home with, a, with many rules or a home with no healthy culture, no rules, no limits. Each member lives focused on their own needs. How to survive uh, this, it's hard. Maybe you have a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old say, saying in their mind, man, when I turn 18, I'm out of here. 
I don't want to live in this dysfunctional home no more. And a lot of us get out. There's something wrong with my house. It's jacked up. There's something wrong with mom and dad. They can't get it right. They can't ask for forgiveness. Our kids want to leave our homes. The home is a war zone. It's a fighting zone. It's an arguing zone. It's blaming. There's no respect. Nobody's taking responsibilities. It's not a place of refuge, no peace. I, I can't relax in my house. There's no security here. It, it, it's a dysfunctional place. Everyone is hurt and can't forgive, but they adopt, they, they've already adapted the dysfunction already. So what do we do? We do it God's way. We do it God's way. That's the only way. There is no other way. You can get therapists. You can get all you, all the, all you want, but only God's way. So let, let, let me give you God's way, a couple of areas of God's way. Number two there in your, in your notes, ways to cultivate a healthy family cult, culture. Just like there's so many factors to our disconnection, there are many ways to heal and connect. The first one, let, let me give you three. Reconnect with their language. In Job, in Job it says, with the same mouth that you condemn is the same mouth that you're going to give life to somebody. It's got to be the same mouth. Why? Because that, th th there's, there's something good inside of me. Have you ever had somebody come into your life and see the best in you and you want to be with that person all the time? That person is there to disciple you, to help you. He's not there to criticize you, to condemn you. He's there to help you. This is the Holy Spirit this morning letting you know. Let me reconnect with language. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Start to change the culture by using a different language in your home. That's why we come to church, to learn the language of love. That's why we come to church, to get stronger as men, to understand our, our position as spiritual leaders. We come to church because if you can praise your God, it'll be easy for you to praise your woman and your children. But if you cannot praise your God, and you have not been broken, things will happen in your life to break you. Sometimes cancer comes in. Sometimes you lose your job. Sometimes something happens and it breaks your heart. And that's what God uses to open your eyes. And maybe you're going through that right now. And he's saying, I'm doing that because I want to take something out of you. God is telling you that this morning. So let me tell you, start to change the culture by what you say. Language creates relationships, creates feelings, emotions. It, it language creates new realities. The next one is emotional reconnection. I want to connect with my kids emotionally because I've already knocked them down so bad. It begins in yourself. It begins in understanding your emotion, man of God, identifying how you feel, understanding the, the reason you feel that way, being in control of your emotions. This is so important because you could hear a message today that will pump you up, that will inspire you, that will motivate you, and you go back to being the same person on Monday morning. That's who we are. We could say on Sunday, I love you, Jesus. But on Monday, you start listening to this flesh and to the, to the enemy's thoughts in your mind. And you fall and you fall every Monday morning. Every Monday morning, emotional reconnection starts with you to know how to control your emotions. Not letting others in charge of your feelings. If you, if you can't have a good relationship with yourself, it's impossible to have a good relationship with others. It's impossible. In other words, it, 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 it's not possible to love others if you don't love yourself. Man, you got to take a shower once a week. You got to shave once in a while. If you can tell your wife you love her, you understand you want the best for her. Then you got to love yourself. Those words are, they're, they're, I mean, those words are heavy. All your relationships begin in love. That intentional and relational love comes from God. So write this down. In order for our relationships to work, we must, we must let the one who designed them define them. Only he can define my relationships because he's the one that designed my relationships. So it's not a religious love. This authentic love produces healing in yourself to build healthy relationships, the healthy culture. You could have, uh, you, you could have this healthy culture, culture in your family. Another thing that should be in your, in your language, in your communication, in your house, is what you, and I'm telling you something right now. I can't change the past of what, what, what's happened in your home. But from this day, May 22nd, forward, you can change the culture by what comes out of your mouth. 
I, I, I don't know if you heard me, man. And I don't want to put you to sleep. So wake up. You can change the culture of what happens in your home by what comes out of your mouth. But God's got to change your heart first. And you got to want to change. If it just comes out from the mouth but it doesn't start from the heart, you ain't never going to change. The Holy Spirit will give you strength to change. You might be sitting here this morning and say, Pastor, why are you zeroing on a man? Because I'm a man. And I know what it is to be a man. So the first word you should have in the culture of your home is forgiveness. Why? Because we're going to hurt each other every day. We're going to insult each other every day. The second word you should have in the culture of your house is acceptance. I accept all my family. And if I want to change them, I go to God first. A lot of times we try to change our kids. Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't live this way. Don't do that. Don't put this. But let me tell you something. If you go to God first, he will do the change. And half of the battle is when they walk away from your conversation, they say, hey, why would I change when you're living the way you're living? Why would I, ch why would I change when you can't even handle your own life? The problem that we've had in our generation is we want our kids to live the way we say it, not the way we live it. It's time that we change our lives and back it up with actions and let them know, this is who I want you to be. <laughs> follow me as I follow Jesus. That's the only way it works. That's the only way it works. The third word that should be in your culture is protection. Your kids need protection. They need a covering. Can you cover your kids with protection? Is your house a house of security? Do you have a, row, a line of kids that want to stay at your house because there is security in your house? It's a safe haven. If nobody wants to come over your house, it means your house is not safe. It's not. But if you've got all the kids down the block that want to be there, man, man, Sister Flip Flop, she's always making cookies. Hermano Sandia, he's always making barbecues, and I love that, man. So all the kids will be at your house, and you want that. That's healthy. You want that. Proverbs 14, 26 says, reverence for the Lord gives a man deep strength. His children have a place of refuge and security in your home. In your home. So it, 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 the, the, the next point is spiritual reconnection, and this is the biggest one. It's not, it's not the last one. It's the main one. Here's where everything starts. The motor of spiritual rec reconnection is prayer. It's praying for the food. Man, if you want to be spiritual leaders and you've never prayed for food, pray for the food for a couple of months and then have Pepito Jr. pray for the food. He's already seen you pray. Now he wants to pray. Or your daughter pray. But you model it first. Pray for the food. Pray at birthday parties. Pray at graduations. Pray at sickness. Pray in, in weddings. Pray at funerals. Pray in conflicts. Speak life over your kids. They will never get life unless it comes out of your mouth. I will pray over my kids when they go to school. I'm going to pray over my wife when she's going through that situation. I'm going to pray. The prayer of the righteous has much power and availeth much. As soon as you open your mouth and you start to pray, power comes out. There is power in prayer. But you got to open your mouth and you got to pray to God. That's part of it. Let me tell you something. The disciples asked, uh, they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. We must teach our family how to pray in our homes and in public. Prayer and reading the Bible is how we reconnect as a family. In other words, you can have a good marriage. If you don't have a good relationship to God, you'll never have a good marriage. They're, they're inseparable. You can have a great connection with your family. You can't have it unless you have a great connection with God. So it takes wisdom to connect as a family. Look at Proverbs 24.3. It takes wisdom to have a good family. And it takes understanding to make it strong. Understanding. Understanding. Uh, the understanding, understanding is, is effort to apply all of this truth into the most radical situations that we face as a family. That's what understanding is. We face a lot of radical situations. It, let me give you an added connection. It's not in your, in your notes, but I want you to write it down. You, you can reconnect with your family. But you got you to gotta, you gotta do this first. 
and write it down. It's, it's called connecting grace. Connecting grace. Write it down in your, in your, in your notes there. Connecting grace. God took all of your sin and my sin in the past and my sin in the present, and, and he still forgives me. That's grace. He forgives you your past, your present, and your future sins. That's grace. We don't deserve it. That's grace. Look at me this morning. Relationships need the same grace. At, at, somebody's got to show your wife and your kids how to forgive. If your kids don't know how to forgive, it's because daddy hasn't taught them. It's not the Sunday school job, Sunday school teachers, to, uh, to show your kids how to forgive. It's dad and moms. We are two good forgivers living in the same house. Forgiveness needs to be in our house every day. Why? Because we're going to mess up every day. So we need that connecting grace. There is there's not a relationship that you can, you, you can stay in right now without grace. Why? Because family relationships are hard. They're imperfect. So what do I do? I, I accept my kids are th 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 I accept that my kids are going to they're going to mess up. For all those controlling mothers, calm down. <laughs> accept that your kids are going to mess up. They're going to break your heart. Jesus died of a broken heart. All our kids are going to break our hearts. That's a given. If I hold them uh, in a level of perfection, I'm setting them up for failure. All my kids have blown it big time, but I'm here to tell you that if you don't break away from tradition, you will never have breakthrough in your life. A lot of us were raised with our daddies beating us. I was raised that way. My daddy beat me. He, he whipped me. What I thought was abuse was discipline. Hello. I deserved every one of them. I was, like in Spanish, I was tremendo. I was heavy duty. But let me tell you something, if you're ever going to break away from tradition, if you're going to have breakthrough in your life, you can't beat your kids. There's going to come a time where you're going to do it your past family's way or God's way. There's going to come a time where you need to man up and be the spiritual leader of this home. You need to discipline your kids with love. Don't beat them. God wants you to start a new culture in your home. And he wants you to start a Jesus culture. I was faced with that same situation in 2006. I was right in the middle of two roads, tradition or God's way. It must have been probably November of 06 where our oldest son ran away. And that night it was raining. My wife went to the room. And it was about 1 in the morning. And she closed the windows and she noticed that our son wasn't there anymore. So she came to the, our bed, and she just was losing it. She, he could be in the middle of the street dead. He could do all, all the, I don't know what's going on. And she was just losing it. I said, calm down. God's in charge. So about 3 or 4 in the morning, we heard somebody. We heard some noise. It was, it was our son. He was coming back. I didn't know what to do. I had two roads. Tradition, beat him down. God's way. He uh, so I went in his room and I took his phone. I said, I'm going to take your phone. I go, just sleep a little bit. It was a Sunday morning. So that afternoon, we, that morning we went to church. We came back and that afternoon I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do. So I grabbed a towel and a bottle of water. And I invited him to my room. My wife was there. We started telling him we loved him. just told him I never loved him more than right now. And I asked him for forgiveness of the stuff that I messed up as a father. So you have that anger problem because of me. So I started washing his feet and praying blessings over him. He started crying. We had a beautiful moment. In the next couple of days, he went and cut his hair. He had long hair. He went and apologized to his sisters. I'm sorry. You're going to do a tradition? You're going to do it God's way. How are you going to discipline your kids when they mess up? I know some of us have some kids that, wow, we don't know what to do. 
but you got to stick to God's way. Tradition, beating them down, throwing them out, ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. God is speaking to you this morning. It takes grace. Let, let me hear everybody say, say, it takes grace. It takes grace. Some of you right now are thinking of running, maybe from your marriage, maybe from your parents, maybe from your house. Maybe you might be saying, Pastor, I cannot handle my parents. Every day they fight. They're insulted. And you think the grass is greener on the other side, it's not. Every family relationship takes grace. That's the grace that you have to give that's been given to you. So get this through your head. The devil is trying to destroy your family relationships. And he'll do anything. The smallest things become blow up. Have you noticed the smallest things in your house become big? By the time you know it, you have a generational curse on your family where the families are mad at each other and they can't forgive each other and they're blaming each other and they're fighting. Every family has a Cain and Abel. Every family has the, Cain, the spirit of Cain and Abel. You have my blessing. I want it. Every family struggles with that. So today, May 22nd, God is going to heal your family relationships. Ecclesiastics 3, 1 and 4 says there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plan, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, now all this makes sense to me till I got to verse 5. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. So what does this mean, Pastor? That th this is the Old Testament ritual that needs to take place in your heart this morning if you're going to be healed. And it comes from Genesis chapter 1, chapter 31, where there was a man named Jacob who, 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 who married uh, a, a couple of, uh, of, 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 of women. And his father-in-law was named Laban. Laban was hard on Jacob. He had Jacob work 20 years for his daughter. J Laban was hard. He was a hard joker. He was just a hard father-in-law. So one day, Jacob couldn't put up with it anymore, and they were asleep in the camp. So Jacob starts, he says, I'm leaving tonight. He took his wives, he took his, his sheep, his cattle. His, he, took his, he took everything, and he ran. But Laban found out. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm going after him. He took some guys. He went after him. One night before he, he caught up to them, the angel spoke to, La, to Laban. And he told him, listen to me. He told him these words. The angel told Laban these words. He told him, don't do what you're thinking right now. God is telling you this morning, don't do what you're thinking right now. Don't run. Stay in the fire. God says, I'm about to heal, I'm about to restore, I'm about to open a door where there's a wall. He says, I'm about to do the impossible, but don't run. Don't do what you're thinking right now, he's telling you. Just as he told Laban, he's telling you. Laban chased him down, confronted him. So Jacob was ready to fight his father-in-law. And Laban says these words that need to become your words this morning. Genesis 31, 44 through 46, he says, Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone. Jacob took a stone. Everybody pick up the stone. As you came in, you got a stone. Everybody pick up your stone. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And he said to his relatives, Gather some stones. Instead of throwing the stones, gather them. You know why they gathered them? Because they were going to build an altar with the stones. Every time you build an altar in front of the presence of God, you got to ask yourself, how am I doing with my dysfunction? How am I doing with my family? Do I want to throw a stone at them? Pastor, I can't put up with that husband. He's been unfaithful. He's been abusive. He's been all of those things that we talked about. I want to throw a stone at him, Pastor. Pastor, I got a son that's dysfunctional. I don't know what to do with him. I'm struggling. 
Are you going to throw it at people? Are you going to take it and pile it up and make an altar before the Lord? They took every offense, every wrong that was done to them, and they built an altar. Look at me this morning. You can throw your stones or you can gather them. You can build an altar. What does this look like when I build the altar? Number one, when you build the altar, you need to admit your mistakes. When you build the altar before the presence of God, I'm a sinner. I, I admit it. He doesn't require perfection. He requires honesty. I'm a sinner. What do I do at the altar? Number two, I abandon the right to get even with anybody. Oof. I abandon the right to get even with that person that hurt me. It could be your wife, it could be your uncle, it could be your mom, your dad, it could be anybody. When you come to the altar and you lay your stone down, you abandon the right for vengeance. We live in a culture where we want to sue everybody. You ready for this? Christians don't take revenge, we forgive. Christians don't take revenge. We forgive. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's exactly what Jesus did. Number three, what I do at the altar, I apply God's grace to my relationships. So today, God wants to heal your relationships. So instead of throwing the stone, instead of saying I'm fed up, let me tell you another thing. That the person that hurt you, that maybe abused you sexually, he or she does not have to be here for you to forgive them. I'm going to let go of this stone this morning. I'm going to build me an altar. Can you let go of your stone? Come and put it up here. And we're going to build an altar. I'm waiting for you up here. I'm waiting for you. I double dog dare you. I double dog chocolate dare you. We're going to build an altar before the Lord with our stones. We're not going to throw them, but we're going to build them up. If you guys want to come down, I won't get mad. If you guys want to come down from up there, I won't get mad. I pray right now that there's a moment to scatter stones. I want to, I want to say goodbye to everybody listening online. We love you. And we're praying that God will heal your family. There would be an incredible connection. But we got some business here we need to take care of before we walk out of these doors. God bless you, Lifehouse. Bless you. Amen and amen and amen. It's so powerful, so awesome when worship just touches your heart and when the Word of God challenges you to just go to the next level in your walk, your faith, and communion with God. Thank you for being with us. Another presentation of Lifehouse to your house and I pray to your heart. And now I pray that you pray about giving, about sowing to this ministry, this ministry that God has called to lead thousands of people to know God, grow together and go serve. This ministry that is serving our communities, that are our ministry in the ways that, that we are serving the indigent, the lost, the broken, the homeless, and your gifts uh, make this ministry go farther. And I thank you for that. Also, would you pray about just joining our team of people that connect us with other people through the different platforms of social media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram. Would you help us by following us, uh, by clicking, and then also by sharing these messages? Please do that. When you do that, you help propagate the gospel. And then lastly, uh, look at our Church Center app. Would you download this la Church Center app? Um, it is something that is a wonder. It is a, a technological wonder. It connects you to what LifeHouse is doing in our communities and how you can come and visit us 
or have others visit as well. So as you move forward, remember that God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Here at LifeHouse, we're for you. God is for you. And thank you for praying for this ministry. And thank you for being part of a ministry that God is using to lead thousands of people to know God, grow together, and go serve. God bless you. We'll see you next time.